Good morning. Hope you all are having a good Sunday morning so far. Um, uh, Pastor Ray is out on vacation, so you get me for this Sunday. Um, I welcome you all. And uh, uh, in the back is coming in here. And we're going to go ahead and uh, start the service by giving some praise to God.
church while Pastor Ray and his wife are on a uh, much-needed vacation. We have a special treat today. James will be uh, giving the sermon. There are still a few more dates for the Hillsboro Concert Series. The fri um, this Friday, the Old Stone School will host the Appalachian Chamber Music Festival. All the music has been really excellent, so don't let trying out a new music genre deter you from coming out, and don't forget to invite your friends and neighbors. This week, the Benevolence team will be serving dinner at both the Shelter and the Tree of Life. The menu will be hamburgers with all the fixings, chips, and dessert. Please reach out to Mavish if you'd like to be involved. And also keep an eye out for those back-to-school sales. We are collecting donations for the Operation Christmas Child Shoebox Ministry and can use things like crayons, colored pencils, and notebooks, the spiral-bound kind that you can roll up and stick in the box. The box packing party and chili cook-off is still in the planning stages, so keep an ear out for details in the coming weeks. And as we have in the past, we will be taking a short break from midweek Bible study, so Wednesday night is canceled this week. All right. So in my past few sermons, I've been talking about James. We covered James 1 and 2. So you won't be surprised that we're going to hit James 3 today. Um, this book of James, it's been kind of compared to a, like a, the Proverbs of the New Testament. And that contains a lot of practical advice for everyday living. Rather than the big spiritual issues, it kind of focuses on the day-to-day. -day. You know, it's written to believers. They have faith in God. Um, they've got salvation through that faith and all that's wonderful but james talks about what does that mean um, and how should that be playing out in the real world how should it be playing out in our lives um, so i have a quick recap of the first two chapters here um, james start out by telling us that if as we're going through various trials that we should be happy about it uh, which seems strange but he goes on to explain that these trials help us to grow and and they build maturity in us and they went on talking about storing up treasures in heaven. Um, you know, any riches we have here on earth, we'll have it for at best a few genera a few decades. Um, so it does not make a lot more sense to store our treasure in heaven where we'll have it for eternity. He goes on to talk about quick to listen, be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. Um, we're going to talk more about the speech today. And then being a doer and not just a hearer of the word. It's great to read the Bible. It's great to listen to God. We should do that. But if all you do is read it and it doesn't impact your life at all, that you don't take it to heart, you don't follow it, it doesn't do a whole lot of good. We move on to James chapter 2. He talks about not showing favoritism. Um, you know, it's great for us to rejoice with other people in their successes and victories, but if we're putting some people up above other people, just following the way the world sees the, the rich and the famous as better and wants to give them special treatment, we shouldn't be doing that in the church because... God created all of us specially. He loves all of us. He died for all of us. Um, so we should not be putting some people better than others. Um, talk about being merciful. Everyone messes up. When we mess up, do we want to be judged strictly or shown mercy? You know, I've heard a story about a guy who's in church, and right in the middle of service, his cell phone rings. Yeah, and I have already made sure my ringer's off, so don't try calling me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was expecting that. Okay, so his cell phone goes off, and the preacher's like, that better be God calling you. And everyone's looking at him, you know, with his annoyed looks and things like that. And he goes home feeling bad. He goes out to a, a restaurant or a bar afterwards, and he spills his drink. And the waitress comes over and says, oh, don't worry about it, cleans it up, gets him a new drink, and he's all set. Now, based on those experiences, is he going to want to go back to church or go back to the bar? Right? And it's great to have mercy everywhere, even at bars, but especially we need to have that mercy at church. So I will not get on to anyone if their phone rings. Don't worry about it. <laughs> um, and lastly, uh, in chapter 2, he talked about faith being apparent and works. And this is where um, people get a bit confused sometimes. He's got the, the phrase, faith without works is dead. And some people have seen this as kind of saying, um, James is saying that we're saved by our works, not by our faith. But it's not what James has been saying. We talked about that. You know, he's saying we're saved by faith, but if your faith has no works coming out of it, is it really there at all? If we truly have faith, we should see those works coming out. Not that the faith doesn't save us, just that the works are a natural result of that faith. 
And so now we switch on to James 3. It starts like this. Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers. Maybe I should just sit down now? No. <laughs> because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep the whole body in check. So what James is really saying here is that if I mess up today, you have to cut me a break. Now, I want to talk about that not many of you should be teachers. Let's be clear, that's not a command, thou shalt not be a teacher. It's kind of a heads up. As he goes on here, um, teachers are, uh, one of the big things they do is they spend a lot of time talking. And he's basically saying, if you talk, eventually we're going to mess up. Where he talks about here, we stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect. Um, let us know that controlling our speech is the hardest thing to do. Um, when you do a lot of talking, you're going to make mistakes. And if you want to talk about being judged harshly, be a teacher and make the wrong type of verbal slip up in front of junior hires. I was going to try to bring some examples here. I looked them up, but none of them were appropriate for church. <laughs> um, but teachers aren't the only ones that do talking. Lawyers do too. And everything they say also gets recorded, and those are appropriate for church. So I brought a few examples. Lawyer. Now, Mrs. Johnson, how was your first marriage terminated? Witness. By death. Lawyer. And by whose death was it terminated? Or lawyer. You were there until the time you left. Is that true? I think so. Uh, I show you exhibit three and ask if you recognize the picture. Well, that's me. Were you present when the picture was taken? I think so. <laughs> now, they sound like stupid quotes, but it's not that the lawyers were stupid in these cases. It's that lawyers spend, especially trial lawyers, I guess, spend a lot of their time talking, and if you talk that much, eventually you're going to say something silly. Or even offensive. And so James is focusing on this chapter on what we're saying. Um, in these verses, he's just introducing that topic that it's very difficult to control our tongue. If you can do it, then you're perfect, which implies that it is the hardest thing to control. Now, there's another group that does, does talk a lot, and that's politicians. And this is going to be controversial, but I actually feel sorry for them on this front. Okay, during a campaign especially, they are going very little sleep, not eating well, making numerous speeches. And in each of these speeches, they're going to be scrutinized. People are looking for any mistake or just a way to twist the words to make it sound bad. And if they can find it, it's going to be on the news and late night all over the district or country or even the world. Um, I think part of the reason we may not have more good people entering politics is that they look at this and they don't want to expose themselves to that type of treatment. So it might be unpopular, but I do think we should probably give even politicians a little bit of a break when they make an honest mistake. We can criticize them on policies and all that, but let's have a little mercy on these honest mistakes. But going back to James here, he continues, when we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what great force is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. Well, look at that last verse there. James isn't mincing any words. But he's try, trying to convey the destructive power that our words can have if we don't use them wisely. Now, when James talks about the tongue, he is talking about it as a metaphor for speech. This is not a passage about not sticking out your tongue. And it's the, not just the words we pick, but the content of our speech. So if someone were to say to you, you're a few pecans short of a, short of a pie, and if you're familiar with that phrase, you'll be offended because of the content of what they're saying, not because they said pecan instead of pecan. Uh, I'm not sure that some people get very uh, concerned about that, so uh, I'm going to leave that topic <laughs> of the pronunciation of that word. Um, there's other cultural references to this, though. It's not just James. Um, you've heard the saying, the pen is mightier than the sword. Um, and there's a more cynical view in a passage of a, a book I enjoy, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, talking about the Babelfish. Now, for those who are not familiar with it, 
Um, it's a small fish that will allow you to hear whatever anyone's saying. It will translate um, different languages. All you have to do is just stick it in your ear. Don't worry, it's fictional. But in describing the Babel fish, um, it says that the poor Babel fish, by effectively removing all barriers to com communication between different races and cultures, has caused more and bloodier wars than anything else in the history of creation. Now, we're all, uh, we want to think that communication is supposed to help us, that easier communication will lead to more understanding. And done right, it can. But look at, for example, the internet. Uh, it provides more opportunity for communication than ever before. And there are a lot of ways it's positive, but look at a lot of communications out there. If you look at the chat uh, stuff after a, uh, on, on the news site, it's basically a cesspool there. It's a great example of how words can set the whole course of one's life and be set on fire by hell. On a more personal level for many of us, have you ever had someone come up and just say something really mean to you and just kind of ruins your day? And you know, we like to say, oh, we can't let it get to you, but the fact that we say that kind of implies that, yes, we can let it get to us. Um, on a more positive note, though, have you ever, ever had someone come up and say something really nice to you and it makes your whole day? You're going through hard times, you may be clinging on to that for the whole day, for weeks even. Um, there's plenty of other, of other examples oh, I was going to mention. So when you have someone say something mean versus something nice, I mean, what do you think about that person who says something mean versus that person who says something nice? And now, which of those two people do you want to be? There's plenty of other examples of the power of words. Spreading rumors, cyberbullying is a huge problem. Um, on the more positive side, Genesis talks about God speaking the universe in, or the world into existence. Um, Jesus in the, in the book of John is referred to as the Word. So words are very powerful, and they can be destructive if not used correctly. And let's face it, it's hard to control your speech. You want to be positive, but in a, the heat of an argument, um, words just pop out. James puts it like this. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. So we've got all types of phrases about this. Putting your foot in your mouth. Speaking before you think. Um, there's advice. Count to ten before you uh, say something. And they recognize the difficulty of controlling what we say. But it's important. And why do we need to control what we say. We all know that communication can help self solve problems. It's a gift God's given us. But too often we use it for evil. And once we start using it for evil, um, it weakens it. Um, if you ever had someone spreading rumors about you behind your back or saying mean things, and it gets back to you, and then they come over and they're like, oh, you know, I didn't really mean it, I'm sorry. So those words they're trying, saying to try to make up for it, they lose their value when we've already heard them you know, talking bad about you. Um, I think about, you know, if, if you've been talking about, about others and then you go to tell someone about Jesus and his love and it's like, wait, weren't you like bad-mouthing so-and-so just a few minutes ago? It can, can ruin the value of our words there. James puts it this way. With the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. So there's a saying when you uh, maybe hear someone cussing up a storm and say, do you kiss your mother with that mouth? I think you can kind of rephrase that for what James is saying here. When someone's bad-mouthing others or just otherwise being mean in what they're saying, do you praise God with that mouth? And this is not just the spoken word. It applies to um, our writing, too, and to the Internet. So think about what posts and comments, what are your posts and comments like? If someone saw your comments online, are they thinking, wow, these Christians are really nice and loving. I need to look into this Christian anything more. And I think some people, they have that down. I see comments, they're great. And then other people, um, like me sometimes, um, it's a little bit more of a struggle because... I like to debate. I like to get into debates, and those are great. It's great to discuss different terms, but they can start to get a bit personal attacks, and that's where it, 
and it kind of goes from having a great debate to um, this poison coming out of our mouth. Um, you know, one example I'll just throw out there, you know, having the, the capitalism versus socialism debate, and if you watch those, it gets to this point of, hey, anyone who supports capitalism uh, is greedy and they don't care about the poor, or anyone who supports socialism, they just want to destroy America. Now, I know people on both sides of that debate, and I can tell you those aren't true. Um, but this is one of those where it's great to de debate the shortcomings and merits of those systems, but not to personally attack the people on the other side of the debate. And of course, making fun of people should never happen online or off, but one of the things we have a plague right now with is cyberbullying. Um, it's done a lot of harm to the kids, it affects school performance, um, mental health, uh, increased anxiety and depression, physical health, um, their involvement with activities, and can lead to vandalism and things. Um, and also greatly increases the risk of suicide. So that's an example of just how bad, how toxic, um, how much filled with poison words can be. Um, and you know, this it includes celebrities and politicians too. Um, you know, sometimes you see a lot of criti criticism of them, or I should say, not just criticism but personal attacks here. And you say, well, they signed up for it. Uh, I do wonder if the reason we don't have more good people in politics is because they're not willing to sign up for that. And they shouldn't. Um, you know, if you're a politician, you should expect to have people criticize your policies and, and how you're doing. If you're an actor, you're going to expect people are going to analyze the movies you're in, and, and maybe they're going to say they don't think you did a good job acting in those. That is the stuff you kind of sign up for. But the personal attacks or worse yet, threats are unacceptable. Um, I remember this is way back um, when Bill Clinton was president. Um, there were a lot of late night jokes about weight on him, a lot of fat jokes basically. And I always thought, you know, I, I, I'll admit I wasn't a big fan of him, but I thought, you know, that's just childish. You know, there's plenty of things to, if you want to criticize, I, I had stuff I could, but, you know, just doing the personal attacks is uh, ridiculous, and it certainly has not gotten better since then. Um, you know, both of our last, current last president got a lot of uh, personal attacks on them. So celebrities and even politicians are real people too. You know, there are celebrities also that have had to, to uh, close down their media account just from all the, uh, the hate stuff that's getting posted on there. They've got feelings, um, and it's not okay to, to do those personal attacks. Um, and the other thing about those types of attacks, if your timeline online is littered with these posts, you know, doing personal attacks against, you know, politicians on the other side or celebrities, um, and then suddenly there's this post about, hey, Jesus loves everyone. How does that come across to people? Um, you know, I think there's a lot of people today who associate Christian with that type of Christianity, with that type of toxicity in those personal attacks. And we need to make sure that uh, our timelines don't support that belief. So we need to control our words, but what are we going to do about it? I mean, James just said earlier that no human can tame them tongue. So what can we do? Well, how about first we start by asking, what can God do if we can? So the first step is to ask him. You know, pray to God. Say, God, help me control my words. So the other thing you can do, too, and that's to guard your thoughts. So just because no one can read your mind, it doesn't mean that you can be thinking all types of mean things about a person and just not say them out loud. Because, A, God can read your mind. But B, those type of thoughts, they tend to start in your brain and come out in your mouth. Jesus put it this way, for the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. A good man brings good things out of the good stored in him, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored in him. So one way to guard your tongue is to first guard your heart. And if you have trouble thinking anything good about some people, and let's face it, some people make that hard, I would uh, suggest start praying that God will help you to see people through his eyes. Because God made them, he loves them, he thought they were worth dying for. So obviously he sees something good, and if we can start to see people through his eyes, I think there'll be a lot more love and a lot less hate there. Now James goes on next to talk about wisdom. We all want to be wise, but if we have to hold back on, 
if, if we have to hold back on our online discussions, then you know, how am I supposed to let people know how wrong they are and how right I am? Well, James talks about wisdom like this. Who is wise and understanding among you? Show of hands, no. <laughs> let them show it by their good life, by the deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. So earlier in a previous chapter, James talked about how our faith should bring forth works. And here again, it's how our faith should be evident in our works. And here again, he's talking about how our wisdom should be evident in our deeds. I love this thing I've heard about knowledge and wisdom. Knowledge is knowing that a tomato is a fruit. Wisdom is not putting it in a fruit salad. In the same way, knowledge um, may be having that great zinger for that debate, and you're going to totally demolish the other side. And wisdom is recognizing that it would not be beneficial to face that. Um, I was in some discussions a couple of years ago about something going on, and, and some people on the other side, they had um, said some stuff that was really did not make too much sense. And so I had this great post set up, typed it up, dripping with sarcasm. It was awesome. It was going to destroy them. And I looked at that, and I was like, oh, I can't post it. I would love to. It's great. It was awesome. But I, I couldn't put it on there. And I, I went back and I reworded it to be a lot nicer. Um, I have to admit, I looked at it uh, last night or this morning. I thought, you know, I didn't do a perfect job of that. But it was a whole lot better than what I was going to put on there in the first place. <laughs> um, so James continues on about stuff here. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. And don't we just see this all over social media? I talked earlier about the comment sections of those news sites. If the wisdom you need to impart is focused on showing others how smart you are and how dumb wrong they are, then this falls, and that falls into this section here, the disorder in every earthly, unspiritual demonic. So what's real wisdom? Well, James continues. But the wisdom that comes from heaven that's first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. So here's the real contrast to what we see online sometimes. Now, one nice thing about social media is that you can type out a reply and then stop before you hit send and read it. Like I was talking about that post I did a, a year or two ago. Read it, look at it. Is it pure? Is it peace-loving? Is it considerate, submissive, merciful, impartial, sincere? If not, maybe you shouldn't be posting it. Um, I've had to use a backspace key on a number of posts, and sometimes I've rephrased them, and sometimes I've just realized I can't post it does mean that people don't get to see how smart I am and how wrong they were, and I miss on getting some real zingers, but our call is not to win the argument, it's to win souls. Um, so the Bible says in Ephesians 4, 6, let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. So James has a number of topics in, in the book of James. Um, and the, in the first two chapters, as I get to the conclusion, I found it really difficult because I was kind of going all over for the different things he mentioned in that chapter. But in chapter 3 here, he's basically stayed on focus on words. He's devoted a, what turned out to be a whole chapter to it. It lets us know that um, it is something that is important. So are our words pleasing to God? Are we focusing on his words? Or are, are our words full of deadly poison corrupting the body? setting the whole course of our life on fire and set it on fire by the fires of hell? Are the words that are coming out of our mouth that are not compatible with the praises of God coming out? If so, let us pray to God to help us guard our hearts and our thoughts. Now, James talked a lot about the practical aspects of Christianity, how we should live our faith. It all starts with our acceptance of Jesus Christ's death on the cross for our salvation for our sins. The Bible says that for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. It also says, For God so loved the world that he gave his, own, his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. 
See, God wants us to live with him for eternity. He's made it simple, as simple as he could, and he's done the work through the cross. So if you still haven't taken that first step to put your faith in God, I'd like to invite you to do it today. So God calls us to a living faith, and that first step is admit we're sinners in need of God's grace, repent from that sin, and accept Jesus' death on the cross as payment for that sin. So if you want to do that day, you can pray with me. So everyone, just close your eyes and bow your heads. Dear God, I have done wrong. I am sorry for the wrongs I have done. I pray that you will help me to do better. I ask forgiveness for my sins. Thank you for dying for me. I accept the gift of grace and seek to follow you. So if you pray that prayer, you've taken that first step, the most important step on the road of faith. So I encourage you to reach out to me or Pastor Ray or another fellow believer. Um, talk about it and keep growing in that faith. Um, and we do have a Bible study here on Wednesday nights, not this Wednesday. And I think we start again in September. Um, but invite you to those to dig more into the Word. And for now, let's, let's pray. Lord, pray, thank you for this time you've given us in your scripture. And pray that you help us to watch what we say, manage our mouths, to control our, our mouth and our thoughts that we can be a good example to others of your love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. All right. Um, I'm going to invite the worship team to come on back up. Thank you all for being with us. God bless you.
God. I'll see you next week.